to those of you who are online and this is your first time tuning in, we love you. We're so happy you're here. Um, the concept behind the show is really simple. It's going to be real talk with really good people, and hopefully we'll have really, really good debate, conversation, and fun. Um, and we want to hear from you. While we're talking tonight, you can follow us on Twitter at, at @mypeoplestv. We're going to be live tweeting. We're going to be snapping at MyPeoplesTV. This is about real conversation, so please make sure to engage with us. So tonight, the topic at hand, there's a lot going on in the world, and we're really in a period of transition and transformation, partially about what is America, who is America, and what is the American identity today. A lot of times when you hear the conversation about American identity, it starts from this place of what we call American exceptionalism, right? This idea that America is the best, the strongest in the world. But the reality is America is what we make it, it's what we say it is, and more importantly, it's what we want it to be. And there's a lot going on in the country that you may not be hearing about on the news, but you're seeing it online, you're seeing it in your Twitter feeds, you're seeing it, frankly, in the streets, and we want to bring that conversation here to talk to some great people, our friends, and you about what it really means to be American today. So that's the conversation we're going to have tonight. Are y'all ready for that? Y'all ready to have some fun? So first up, our first guest tonight is a dear, dear friend. He's an activist, an entrepreneur based here in L.A., has done some tremendous work around a whole host of issues, including criminal justice. But guess what? He's also a musician. So please welcome Mike De La Rocha. How you guys all doing? Uh, this is for uh, my mentor, Tim, who's in the audience. I uh, always got to give love to those that helped raise this, so. Oh, oh, please, I didn't do anything. Oh, oh, please, oh, I just want to leave. Oh, oh, please, my hands are up. Oh, oh, please don't shoot me. Don't wait for me. Don't wait for me. I'm not coming home No, I'm not coming home Oh, oh, please Oh, I didn't do anything Oh, oh, please I just wanna leave Oh, oh, please, my hands are up. Oh, oh, please, don't shoot me. Don't wait. I'm not coming home No, I'm not coming home No, I'm not coming home No, I'm not coming home Oh, oh, please So you're killing me Shoot. 
policía Yo tengo un familia Policía Por favor oh, Officer You're killing you as you're killing me Oh, officer You're killing you as you kill Kill, killing me Thank you so much for blessing yeah. us with that. What was that song about? Uh, that song was about um, predominantly black bodies being killed by the state, whether it's police or prisons or, um, you know, uh, racist structures that exist, you know? Um, uh, I wrote that specifically after all the stuff that was going on in Ferguson or just in general, a lot of the stuff that's happening around the country. and. I really want to, when we think about this, uh, really want to also center those that don't speak uh, English, mm -hmm. speak different languages, have different identities, and so, because uh, um, there's a lot of pain, but a lot of beauty also going on. You know, as a result, one of my favorite people in the entire universe is going to be joining us today um, that uh, said enough's enough, and we want to center um, center our lives, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, and it's interesting, you know, that we start with a, a song and a conversation about, um, you know, black bodies, mm -hmm. state violence. You mentioned people who, you know, English is not their first language, mm -hmm. bringing in other cultures. And, you know, I think when, when I'm hearing that, I'm, I'm struck by how much your work it, both in your art and your activism in criminal justice reform and immigration, how much it centers on people who have actually been told that part of the American identity is not for them, right? Right, right? That there's this ideal of what it means to be American, but there are a couple groups of people who are the exception, whether right. that be people of color, whether that be people who are currently or formerly incarcerated. How do you relate to that concept then of American identity when mm -hmm. your work is really focused on people who've been told, ah, it, it doesn't belong to you? Yeah, I think, um, first off, I love all you guys. Thank you guys for being here. We love you. I had to, um, we got a great crowd. I was told, I said they were hype, and then somebody really just told me, like, stop saying that, say they're lit. So we have a lit crowd tonight. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> it's also, I'm, I'm also trying to, like, um, I'm trying to come down, like, I'm sweating, because it's so emotional playing yeah. those, those kind of songs. But I think my, one of my favorite quotes is from, I was grateful and blessed to be raised by a movement in southern Mexico called the Zapatista Movement. And what they really instilled in a lot of us was that this concept of, um, we are the same because we're different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think oftentimes when we think about America, we think you have to fit in in certain boxes. And I think the beauty of being Mexican, for example, um, we come from Africa. Um, slave ships came to, you know, came to Mexico as much as they went everywhere else, but we're a mixture of indigenous and Spanish and Mexican. And, and so for me, I always just try to figure out a ways to find the humanity within mm -hmm. all the different things going on, you know? Um, and so for me, American identity, it's hard for me because I identify as Chicano, but then there's so many other identities. I'm a skateboarder, I listen to punk music. Like, so for me, it's trying to figure out um, in the context of, of mass movement building, mm -hmm. um, what's gonna be the most beneficial to really shining a light and up uplifting voices that oftentimes don't get heard. Yeah, so. that makes a lot of sense. And I wanna yeah. actually bring out, because you mentioned, we talked about all these different identities, you yeah. mentioned being Chicana, but also kind of all these other <laughs> identities. I wanna bring out a white dude, is that okay? I wanna bring out, <laughs> it's really I wanna good. bring out somebody that you all may have seen before. You may know him from Hunger Games, um, but he's also been out there beating up the, the campaign trail, encouraging people to vote. He's an activist, um, a, a politico, but again, also a Hunger Games actor. He is Josh, Josh Hutcherson. Josh, come on up. You don't have to stand. We're gonna keep on doing this. So, so I, I yes. introduced you by saying all the things that you do, 
but also yes. mentioning that you were a white boy. Because um, <laughs> I think it's yeah. important to talk about, right? Especially oh, as we talk about American identity. Um, and you were raised in Kentucky, right? You're from yes. Kentucky. Yeah. So, you know, there's a whole set of um, assumptions and stereotypes about what it means to be a southern white guy, but you're also millennial, you live in Hollywood. Yeah. Like, how do you kind of take all these pieces <laughs> and, and package it into an American identity? Well, I think I, I have a really unique kind of situation because I'm, I'm from a very conservative area uh, in Kentucky in the South, um, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, and, and my family was extremely liberal, like always growing up, we were always about equal rights and, and fighting for civil rights and things like that. Um, so that was kind of in my, ingrained in just my upbringing and who I was. Um, but I started coming out to California, I was like nine years old. So I kind of like had this weird duality that I was living, going back home and, and talking with friends and family members back there that had a very different worldview than I did because I got to come to California and meet people mm -hmm. and see outside of this little bubble, you know, right. I think a lot of times the people that I meet that aren't as open-minded or a little more conservative or not as aware about what's happening around them is because they sort of grow up in these little communities that keep them inside and it keeps like the indoctrination and just sort of repeats itself. Um, so for me, I got to break away from that and, and since coming out here, I've, I've met people from all over the world, every type of demographic from different backgrounds and everything and once you connect and you realize that the unifying thing is the human experience. Mm -hmm. And that, that we all have insecurities, we all have dreams and desires, and, and once you kind of find that common ground, that is where I think you can sort of learn that empathy and realize that, yeah, maybe I'm white, maybe you're black, maybe I'm from Kentucky, I don't know where you're from. I'm from Maryland. Maryland. Mm -hmm. Maryland yeah. uh, you know, so I mean, but like, people have so many different stories, and once you realize that there are so many things that we all feel and, and experience as a humanity, yeah. I think that's where you can find the common ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. And you mentioned, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, you talked about you were able to kind of have that awareness and understanding because you left home. Yeah, but I'm true. curious to know, so we still see what's happening back home, right? right we know yeah, what's yeah. happening in Kentucky, oh, and kind yeah. of how the geographic uh, mm. segregation of this country has absolutely. really made, made for some really, um, I guess, uh, values challenges, right? Sure, in, sure. in terms of who America is and what mm -hmm. America wants. Do you go back home? Do you take the mm -hmm. messages that you've learned? If so, why? And if not, why not? Oh, absolutely, I do. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not like going home and, and like preaching to people about it yeah. exactly, but also like through, I think through social media, and that's one of the things right now that is of this time, like the millennials, like my our, our generation yeah. is that we're all so connected. And I can learn a story about somebody in New York being from Kentucky. So I think the social media platform is massively important for that. But yeah, I, th I think when I go home and we have these conversations about equality, about gender equality, racial equality, all the uh, institutional racism, like mm -hmm. all these things, I love getting those debates and talking about it because I get very passionate and worked up about it. So yeah. I, I'm, I think it's super important to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I, I know a lot of people back home who start talking about like institutionalized racism and they have a, a really twisted perspective on it because they, they start saying like, well, you know, if, if, they, if they want all these things, they need to work for it. I'm like, yeah, but you have to realize that from the day that a young kid is born into a certain circumstance, whether it's a young black kid somewhere that is like a lower income household, from the moment that he starts going to school, he is shown a different thing than I'm shown. Mm -hmm. And so from that mm -hmm. point moving forward, you have to understand that, that that is ingrained in our society. And so it's not just like all of a sudden like, oh, you need to now be more uh, better educated. More better educated? <laughs> That's very ironic. Great, great, um, great. But no, I, but yeah, I'm not more but better like, educated. Uh, but no, I think, but like the you know pick I mean? yourself no, exactly. up yeah, by yeah, the bootstraps yeah, yeah. Like you mentality. You can't just say that because there's so much that, there's, it's a bigger thing than that. It's not just about like, oh, I, I can make the choice as a person now to become something else. You need the support. Yeah. You need the acceptance of the community and of the government to show, it, show itself that you are just as valid. You deserve the same quality education, the same job opportunities. And then once we get to that point, then we're going to have a more equal society. So we're all kind of yeah. think fighting for a lot of the Absolutely. same things, I believe. Well, speaking yeah. of fighting for those things, oh. um, I'm going to bring up one of my sheroes. I'm so mm -hmm. excited to introduce it to y'all if you don't already know her. Um, her name is Patrice Cullors. She is one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. But oh. I mean, yeah. she's done so much more than that, y'all. She's been an organizer for 15 years, doing amazing things. She's an artist and a creative, and above all, a brilliant, brilliant woman. Please welcome Patrice.
Okay, so Patrice, you've heard a little bit of the conversation we I'm had. I'm like, can I lean back? Yes, lean, <laughs> lean all the way lean back. back. Oh, it's fun. real comfortable. Um, for <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so you heard what we were just talking about, about identity and, and kind of geographic diversity, institutional racism. We, we dropped a lot of these really big terms. Um, but you've been talking about this stuff pretty much your whole life. Half my life. Half yeah. your life. Okay, yeah. tell us where, where this, this kind of drive for community organizing and activism got started for you. Um, in a little town called Reseda, California. Mm -hmm. Anybody know that town? Valley. Yeah. Anybody from the Valley? Oh, yeah. All right, no one from the Valley here. Um, we're just right over the hill, and I went to a high school that was a social justice, had a social justice program. Yes, that exists. And in that high school, I learned, I didn't have to learn about it, but I got language for racism and sexism and homophobia and patriarchy, and it changed my life. Yeah. It's where I was introduced to Bell Hooks. <laughs> To Audrey Lord, it was where I was introduced to the readings, um, uh, uh, the uh, the reality of the Black Panther Party and what they did, and political prisoners. And um, I was like, finally, something that feels like um, something that actually feels like real, mm -hmm. um, and that is uh, giving me uh, the ability to name what my actual experience is living in. I grew up in Van Nuys and I grew up in Canoga Park and, and really, you know, a lot of poverty in the, and I grew up in the war, during the war on drugs, the war on gangs. And I witnessed LAPD at its finest. Mm -hmm. uh, I witnessed the LA Sheriff's Department um, and the reality of LA County jails. And I finally had this like language to talk about my family's experience, my mm -hmm. single mom who raised four kids, worked three jobs, had very little time for herself, let alone us. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, who was a drug dealer and a drug user, mm -hmm. and um, how much the war on gangs ripped our family apart, literally. And so I think we're in, an, it's like an exciting time to be alive. We're in the middle of some of the most uh, brilliant times to like movement build and fight back these big systems. Yeah, and I know when you when you talk about your work, and I've heard you talk about it before. You know, there's the police brutality, which is one specific thing, but you talk about it as state violence more broadly, mm -hmm. right? Tell tell us about some of the work that you all are doing right now. Oh man, um, well I think it's important to know that Black Lives Matter is more than just sort of this hashtag. It is. Uh, there's uh, there's one uh, there's a network um, and the network has 32 chapters across the the globe. Um, exciting work to me is this the work that's happening in this country, but also the work that's happening internationally. Um, folks have are using Black Lives Matter in their own context mm -hmm. um, and in Europe. At sea, um, folks are using Black Lives Matter inside of the state of Israel to talk about. Um, the Ethiopian Jews uh, and their fight against police pr brutality. Folks are using Black Lives Matter in Toronto, Canada, to talk about uh, folks like Andrew Loku, who was killed in his home within seconds by Toronto Police Department. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you're seeing Black Lives Matter joining up with people, like with the fight for 15 folks who are fighting for a livable wage, and you're seeing Black Lives Matter talk about housing. And I think. Um, we are really trying to expand this conversation around what is black. Um, that black folks aren't just, the only black people to fight for aren't just cis, heterosexual, straight black men. Mm -hmm. um, that black yeah. trans women, mm -hmm. that black trans women who are being killed um, uh, at an exponential rate need to be fought for, that we need to be on the front lines as cis people to fight for, for them as well. And, that black queer folks uh, need to be fought for and black folks who are incarcerated. I just got an Instagram message from a brother inside um, because, you know, folks, we sneak in phones inside. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say his name on, on, on the <laughs> web, amazing. but he hit me up and was like, we, we are watching y'all mm -hmm. and we want, we want to be in conversation. And so I think um, it's, a, it's exciting. Like, I just feel like it's, it's hard, it's challenging, but it's also like, exciting right now. I'm gonna ask you one more question, before, yeah. and then you can lean back. I okay, promise. good. <laughs> I I couldn't lean back and talk. I know you wanted it was to too lean comfortable. Back, but, um, I was like, this is serious. <laughs> but, but something that you said just jumped out at me as you were explaining what Black Lives Matter is doing across not just the country but the world. Mm -hmm. You continue to say folks are using Black Lives Matter too. Mm -hmm. Folks are using Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter too. 
And as someone who, you know, I used to work in Washington politics, national politics for organizations, mm -hmm. right? And as we talk about American identity, I think there's something interesting about the traditional leadership model yeah. in, in America, mm -hmm. right? Which really stems from this idea of top-down, charismatic mm -hmm. leader with power and a hierarchy. Yeah. Right? Whether you're talking about, you know, the presidency, whether you're talking about the church, wherever yeah. you go, there's that model. And yet when I hear you talk about Black Lives Matter, it's like folks are doing this mm -hmm. and using this. Yeah. Why is that important to you? Um, takes a village. Yeah, it's good. I think it's important because uh, we will not win. We can't win with a single person leading us. Um, and that's actually just not true. Yeah. Um, MLK didn't, wasn't the only one. Um, and when we uh, fixate on an individual, um, we lose the quality of this movement. Mm -hmm. um, we are not an individual. Uh, we are a collective of people, and that that the face of that people is multi. It's, there's so many different faces of, the, of of the people of Black people in particular and our allies. And so I think uh, it's just not true to to say that there's an individual leader, or even say that there's three leaders, three co-founders. You know, I think there's uh, what say their the, names though, so people do know who they myself, are. Myself, uh -huh. Patrice Colors. Oh, I mean, you are. Yeah. Um, Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi. Uh huh. Uh, but our vision for, for the project and uh, the political project was always, how do we build black leadership? Mm -hmm. How do we build new leaders? Um, and how do we uh, actually make sure that folks don't Rosa Park us, mm. right? Um, that we don't get... <laughs> we, <all laughs> we went to church right there. That we don't get Ella baker because yeah. we know and the reality, Ella, Ella Baker was the architect yeah. of the civil rights movement. Yeah. Um, and she had serious critiques of MLK. I mean, if you go back and read her writings, she has serious critiques of of this establishment. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's important. And it's important to um, be honest about who's really leading and who's fighting. And that leadership is my mother watching my child right now. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so an activist and an entrepreneur who, when he introduced himself to me, said that he watches the Senate like most people watch the NFL. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want to bring up and introduce to you all Makad Brooks. Yeah. Really about connecting the people at large, right, right, to information and frankly, information that will help them better understand their government, the people who are supposedly leading and representing <laughs> them. Talk to me about that. Uh, that was broad. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an app called MyCan, and it's basically, I'm taking the best practices of like eHarmony and Match.com, and I assess your core values, and then based on your core values, I can tell you who to vote for, and nice. based, but based on what's important to you, the, mm -hmm. the, the gradation scale. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, in the app, I put you into a, a shadow Congress, so that you're able to, so like your, your legislator, whatever they're voting on, comes to your phone as a notification, so oh. you can vote on it too, mm -hmm. you okay. have instantaneous accountability. Right? Right. Like, like, that, you know, we all, even, yeah. I'm sure everybody here is politically motivated or interested, but it's hard to like sort of data mine that yourself, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I just want to make sure, like, I, 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 I worked in the Obama campaign, the Bernie campaign, and I saw that people were so, they were so fed up and, and disaffected by politics because there was no way to get information. Totally. Mm -hmm. And so like, they were lied to, mm -hmm. like <laughs> systematically mm -hmm. lied to. And I, I, it broke my heart. I, I found myself in tears in barbershops and in the, the projects like, where people mm. just didn't feel like they mattered. Mm. But I'm like, you know what? In election day, that's the one day you really do matter. Mm -hmm. Like Mitt Romney has one vote. So do you. Right. Like the richest dude in America has one vote. Yeah. So do you. Mm -hmm. So at least negate him. You know what I'm saying? Because like, he, he ain't worried about you. Right. So. so this idea of everybody having one vote and being right. equal, Yes, theoretically, <laughs> right? Yeah. Theoretically. Well, I mean, with, yeah. Well, so how do you Citizens United is sort of is backfiring in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, because like what when you have two candidates who are make, who who are, well, Bernie is is very successful. If if I think if the rules were a little more fair, he'd be, he'd be more successful. But he's getting he's getting campaign contributions of twenty five dollars, fifty dollars, mm -hmm. and he's raising he's breaking records. Mm -hmm. um, Trump self finance. So like. It's not working in their favor. Mm -hmm. You know, Citizens United. Money does yeah. not always fix a problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it creates new ones. Work. And and I think that you know I think but but I think the real problem is 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 redistricting. 
and the real problem yeah, yeah. is is gerrymandering. And if, if we lot, can, yeah. like for instance, yeah. in Kentucky, yeah. Yeah. we can carve out. We can carve out <laughs> because. Thank you. Also, too, like yeah. that, just to mm-hmm. bounce off that. Yeah. Like Bernie, not to start preaching about him, mm-hmm. but you know his whole thing is he does these incredible speeches talking about all these things that he believes in this country can be and all these great ideas and everything. But he ends every single one with saying that I can't do this alone. Right. 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 I can't do it alone. It's not. It's not me. Us. That's like what they're talking about on Twitter and everything. Mm-hmm. It's like it's the U.S. You have to get involved. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Completely. And so like you have to be engaging and the problem is like what you're saying they don't they don't want you to be engaged right because if you saw what they're really doing you'd be like wait no i don't want that that's not what i want my government yeah. to be like if, if they had accountability you'd be like wait press pause yeah um, exactly and reset because you need to go yeah, right. yeah. so <laughs> yeah there has, no, there has to be a forum for that yeah, yeah. well we're going to move on to our next section and we're going to come back to this conversation we've been talking a lot about the they did anybody else get dj Khaled vibes right there they don't want you to win <laughs> they don't want you to know the key to success <laughs> So we're going to move into the news section of our evening because we do want you to know. We do want you to win. So I'm going to bring up journalist, activist, Wendy Carrillo for the news. Wendy, 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 tell tell us what is going on in the world that we should know about. Absolutely. So there's three pieces of news that we're going to cover today. The first one, let me start off with an update on what we know as the bathroom bill. Mm -hmm. So this past week, the Department of Education and the Department of Justice gave guidelines to public schools that would literally tell them, if you don't give transgender students the right to access a bathroom that identifies with their transgender identity, this is a huge deal, huge deal. And in light of what's happening in North Carolina with HB2, which let's face it, let's just call that the anti-transgender bill, it is about civil rights and access to privacy and protecting a student's right to identify with what they identify as. So it's a huge win. Moving on to story number two, an update as what's happening in Flint, Michigan, which let's face it, it's a real case of environmental racism and environmental injustice. Basically decided that we're going to start Stop, stop using water from Lake Huron, which is the biggest, largest freshwater source in the world, mm. literally located in Michigan, wow. and that switch right, <laughs> and and switch the water use from there, and actually start using Flint River water, which has been used as a toxic dump in the ba- in before. That's so aggressive. <laughs> and it would have. That's, so, that's, like, that's like an act of aggression. It's not yeah, like, exactly. That's, like, it's so that's a great. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. It's, yeah. it's a crime, right. and it would have. Yeah. But get this, right. like I love following the money. Mm-hmm. It would have cost the state one hundred dollars a day mm. to actually treat the water mm. for three months, which which would have been about nine thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And they didn't do that because it was ineffective. They just wanted to save money. So instead, now it's going to cost them more than three hundred billion dollars to actually fix the pipes wow. in all of Flint. And if you were a homeowner in Flint, guess what? Your house value is right. nothing anymore. And yet the so governor is still the governor. No one's been arrested. No one's in jail. Yeah. Everyone's free. Yeah. So a literal, a literal, a literal yeah. crime, right? Yeah. And so, and on top of that, there's been an outbreak of what's known as Legionnaires' disease. This is a yeah. bacteria mm. caused by untreated water. Mm. There is absolutely no vaccine. This is a first world country. Right. Yeah. Exactly Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But let me <laughs> let me add a little more to that. And that's the undocumented community okay. in Flint. So if you don't have ID yep. and you're afraid of being deported and you're afraid of police, not only have you been poisoned, yeah. but now you can't even access the free water that's being passed out because they had been requesting ID to actually get bottled water. Yep. Wait, wait. Yeah. Say that slowly. Yeah. yeah. If you are undocumented, you mess my water up, and I gotta show you proof of <laughs> yeah. who I am right. to get some water. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so they say, oh well, we're wow. not we're not asking wow. for that anymore. But welcome to Rome. Right. <laughs> but now people yeah. are afraid. So once you instill fear, yeah. that's all you need for people to like shut their doors, not want to talk to someone. Disengage. We just <laughs> need to need to get them oh, some motherfucking yeah. water. Yeah. You know. Okay. I've worked on that all afternoon. The only thing I'd push back, though, is that, um, like, uh, 
there's a lot of strong Detroiters in this room that would say that's like, right. no, that's not, that's not cool to say though, mm -hmm. you know, because if that was us here in LA, mm -hmm. we wouldn't want to say we're District 12. Mm -hmm. It's just another example of institutional racism mm -hmm. because they're undocumented, they're black people, it's a historically black city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing like Katrina, mm -hmm. yet, you know, um, we have to just be very true. cognizant of how we frame so, things yeah. because yeah. our family members are still living in that beautiful city because mm -hmm. regardless of what happened with the water, our people are still there. Yeah, I read that more though, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read okay. that more as though like how they're being treated. Right. Yeah. You know, like, like the government is... is no, no, is, I get that, yeah, but I'm saying... Like, it's a good point. <laughs> but hey, you know, if it brings, if it sparks conversation, yeah. that's a step forward. Absolutely. So last story, and this is a story that actually I'm very passionate about. But so um, a story broke out this week that the Obama administration is planning to do severe uh, raids and deportations in May and June that specifically yeah. target mm -hmm. Central American mothers and children who are fleeing violence. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an, you know, an insane thing to think about. And I, we want to post a question on Twitter as well. Should Central Americans that are fleeing violence in their home countries be considered a illegal immigrants or two refugees? And I love your your answer. We'd love to hear your answers on Twitter at at My People's TV. Mm -hmm. Let us know what you think. And I want to post it as well to the panel here. Should they be cons what should they be considered? Considering now also that El Salvador is now known as the homicide capital in the world right. as of December of last year. With, yeah. with, with political unrest. So I, I don't think it matters what your opinion is. There, there's a definition and words mean things. Mm. They are refugees. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the other thing I was going to say is the, the civil war in El Salvador was created by U.S. policy. Exactly. exactly. And so we created this war that led people to leave violence to come here yeah. and we seeking refuge from our war right yeah. check it out yeah. we knowingly as a government are sending eight-year-olds five-year-olds back home that exactly. we know they're going to be killed yeah you know? that we and started. so how about american identity yeah right, right. you know what i'm saying so like no, that's exceptional yeah. yeah yeah but part of american identity is this idea of having historical amnesia right mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. we do things yeah. here yeah. and yeah. Uh, elsewhere in the world and then we go why are you so mad yeah, yeah. yeah. why are you so mad though yeah um like, but when do you started by saying this story is really personal to you you want to share why sure so i'm salvadorian mm -hmm. my family and i immigrated to this country because of the civil war mm -hmm. because we were fleeing mm -hmm. my father died mm -hmm. in the war trying mm -hmm. to you know, protect our country and trying to fight a very unfair system that was getting a lot of public funding from, let's, you know, American foreign policy. And mm -hmm. we have three plus, mm -hmm. three presidents that were involved in that, mm -hmm. Carter, Reagan, and the first Bush. Mm -hmm. So when I hear these stories about my mom and my not, my mom and my not, and myself actually leaving our country, we didn't leave because we wanted to leave. Right. We left right. because we were forced to. Right. Yeah. And when we think about these women and children who are also fleeing violence in what is now the murder rate capital in the world, where the murder is more than 6,000 people per 100,000. Mm. So if you look at everybody in this room now, we're about 100 people, half this room would be gone. Mm. So that's significant. And so, yeah, it's personal. The political is personal. Mm -hmm. And you just can't sit idly by and think like, oh, this doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. And how is a toddler going to defend themselves in court, which is our current immigration yeah. system? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's also messed up because as an American, like, that's not what I believe at all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. We're talking about like American identity. Like, what I want America to represent is, is like this beautiful, safe, not a melting pot because everybody's not blending together. It's like a salad bowl, with, like all different right. types of things, and all mm -hmm. crazy beautiful explosion of vegetables. But it's like, like I don't want people around the world to see Americans doing this. Like that's not yeah. what I would do at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's really frustrating when you see a government that's doing something that is so against what I believe in, and what I think probably most of us here believe in mm -hmm. as Americans. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it's terrifying. Which, which is why we need accountability. We have to have. Yeah. Yeah. Plug it, yeah. yeah, but I mean, like, but I, I got you. We, but we need, thank you. But we do need, <laughs> we do need that that direct connection and, and accountability with them. And we're seeing it more and more with this, like the the leak thing that came out. Like the the you're saying that that email somebody right. maybe. Right. So Routers is a news agency that actually got a hold of internal documents, and right. that's how they were able to say. And the Department of Homeland Security hasn't hasn't uh, denied it or s agreed upon it. So that, which leads us to believe that it's actually going to happen. And it happened already for two days in January. The Obama
Obama administration, which <clears throat> sadly President Obama is known among, amongst immigrant communities as the deporter in chief. Right. Mm -hmm. No other president in the mm. history of the United States has deported more people mm -hmm. than Obama. Mm -hmm. So how do we as a community support his ideas, but also hold him accountable that mm -hmm. this is right. not okay? Yeah. And then going after w vulnerable women and children and is we also talked, not and okay. We talked about that, and, but I'd like you to say this in public. Why? Why, why? why does he go after women and children? Like, why? Women and children are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, when That's you crazy. say when you say publicly that you're going after criminals, mm -hmm. but in action you actually go after women and children who are fleeing violence, mm -hmm. yeah. it says a lot about your administration mm -hmm. and it says a lot about us as a country yeah. that mm -hmm. allow for that to happen. Right, right. And that's yeah. the thing, we have, a, we have a hardcore accountability problem in this country. I mean, you look at the 08 um, subprime mortgage crisis. Mm -hmm. Those people from all those massive banks are now getting bigger and bigger again. One and guy none of, Yeah, exactly. One guy Just like they had to pay like, oh, mm -hmm. write a check for $3 billion and then here mm -hmm. we go. And mm -hmm. you destroyed the lives of so many people. Right. And if our mm -hmm. government is willing to do that, what, what else they are they going to do? And that's, I mean? that's actually one of the reasons why I love, we're talking about voting and elections and accountability, but that's one of the reasons I love and admire the Black Lives Matter movement so much because there's conversations certainly about political, right? Disruption that Black Lives Matter has been doing around that. Around every around what? Around, exactly. I'm sorry, around yeah. around some of these issues that we've been talking about, about um, cor uh, government corruption, mm -hmm. around, again, this is, to me, a perfect example. This yeah. is state violence. Like, the mm -hmm. stories that you, uh, Wendy just ran yeah, through that's state fall violence. under the, yeah. the umbrella of state violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, first, I just, it's important for folks to understand, like, disruption is the way in which we create new beginnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like, that's mm -hmm. just, it. that's it. Dis you disrupt. You disrupt a narrative. You disrupt the space. Like, Imagine if someone walked up in here and started yelling, right? Or started chanting. Like it's yeah. gonna it's gonna change up the chemistry and the energy more. in here. You can't. <laughs> yeah. And so I think for us some of the some of the dopest things we've done, mm -hmm. um, and the most exciting for me has definitely been like highway shutdowns, right? Yeah. Like yeah. folks yeah. on the one oh one or the four oh five going going to their, their Christmas vacation, going to see their mm -hmm. loved one and all of a sudden they get stopped. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're like, Are you serious? <laughs> Yep. I need to, and we're like, are you serious? Right. Someone just died yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was shot by the police, and uh, y you're not talking about it, right? You get to see your loved one. You might miss your plane, mm -hmm. but you get to see your loved one anyways. This person will never, ever, Sandra Bland's mom will never see her daughter again, mm -hmm. right? Ezel Ford will never see his mother again. Mm -hmm. And so um, disrupting people's lives so they can see something different, so they can get woke. Yeah. Right, so you gotta shake them a little bit. You Always wake them up to it because when you get and this goes deep into like corporate greed and power structures and everything. But like when you create a society, like we were saying before, that's ignorant to what's going on around them. You just focus in your little superficial world about like which car you're gonna buy next or you know mm -hmm. like how big is my TV. Mm -hmm. Then you don't pay attention and focus and actually connect the humanness of these issues. Exactly. Yeah. And so the disruption element does that. I feel like yeah. it just it, it yeah. makes you wake up from your little zombie fate that yep. you face and what's actually happening around you. Yeah. yeah. The bubble. The bubble. Consumerism. It's, mm -hmm. But it, there's so many issues, even the, the three pieces of news that I just covered that really can unite the country mm -hmm. into actual political change and revolution. It's just a matter of whether we want to do it or not. Yeah. I mean, I have hope, but after, after, after um, I, I, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but the, the, the 26 children that were killed uh, Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. After we couldn't galvanize after that, mm -hmm. I lost a lot of faith mm -hmm. in, in, in our organizational abilities mm -hmm. and, and our, our abilities to get motivated to affect change. Like, that was, I don't know. I mean, I'm, well, po I'm, I'm posing something if, to the panel here. That's, that's really dark, though. Yeah. I mean, if if you can have an event like that that takes place and right. still these kind of weapons are allowed, it's, like it's, what? it's, it's like, mind boggling. I, it, that, that's terrifying. Yeah. As, a, as, a, as identifying as an American, if we so, as, a, as a country can allow that to happen and then don't make changes, because like the, massive, the, yeah, big changes that need the, to be made. These weren't poor kids. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, sure. These, these, yeah, these weren't, you know. So, one, one thing I just want to acknowledge, because I, I always have to do this, but I just really want to acknowledge Patrice um, and the black women of Black Lives Matter in particular, <coughs> because the hope is that they didn't wait for the government to do something right. different. Mm -hmm. Right. And the other thing, besides disruption, I just really want to say it's not just disruption. They're 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 pushing American politics and American culture forward in a way that wouldn't be possible without the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but, but I want to actually give the floor because I feel like um, I'm taking up too much space. But I just want to really acknowledge and say it's not just disruption. They're recreating and imagining a real 
world that doesn't have to rely on prisons or rely on police or rely on something else. So we can only create something new if we're able to be courageous enough to imagine. And I know how much, you know, um, all of us, a lot of us will go back home, but a lot of people won't. Right. And so the, also the risk that, that people have been taking has been so incredible. So I just want to allow you to continue to just be your beautiful self because like, um, it, it takes a lot to shut down a fucking freeway, for example, <laughs> you know? Like, you're going to prison. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so a lot of us aren't willing to do some of the stuff that pushes us as a country forward. Mm -hmm. so. and, yeah. and to that point, I think, I think... We're getting, like, the sign, by the way. I know. Okay. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in control. Okay. <laughs> so you keep talking. Cool. Good. Last, last comment, yeah. and then we'll... Patrice, were you going to say something? Um, yeah, I mean, you know... It's, what's interesting is we are in this movement moment, and what I, I what I said a lot of things that are exciting that we're doing. But what I do want to point out before we sort of close out is the thing the things that I think are lacking across the board is still a deeper and more profound conversation about patriarchy, mm -hmm. sexism, mm -hmm. transphobia, mm -hmm. in particular, <laughs> and the the real life impact it actually has on sometimes our ability to mo to move as a movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so even thinking about like Sandy Hook, I'm thinking about like guns and like war is really like that's chock full of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. right, it's, it's, and if we're not true. actually having those conversations, mm -hmm as well as the conversation on racism or having it as a, in a way that talks about the intersections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and that's why this movement looks different, right? It feels different and has a capacity to be different mm -hmm. because we are trying to talk about the intersections. Yeah. And we're trying to talk about not just the outside, not just the government, but like inside. Mm -hmm. if, if at the end of the day, we win all these policies and we change laws, but we're all bruised and battered mm -hmm. and don't trust one another, mm -hmm. yeah. What the, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. So, so part of my work is yes, it is challenging government. I'm always gonna do that. That's like, that's like what gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. But the other part of my work is like, how, do I, how am I better to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do I make sure um, uh, other folks are better to you, to me, and I'm better to folks? And not in that like cheesy, touchy feely way. In like a real life, like fierce compassion type way, mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, if we actually have the world we want to live in, as in the government we want to be under, yet we haven't changed the structures inside of us that still believe in racism in the inside of us, right? Yeah. That still believe in patriarchy. We're, we will just recreate those systems. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's a good place to pause because you left us with a lot to think about that I think I want to even, I want to go a little bit deeper mm -hmm. a little, in a minute. Yeah, so, so before we do that, we're going to take a break because it got real heavy, um, and necessarily so. Um, but one of the things that's really important to us here at My Peoples is not just that we do a lot of talking, but as you saw uh, with Mike in the beginning, we believe that arts and culture is a great way to touch hearts and minds and really open up the space for this type of dialogue. Um, so I want to bring to the stage so, so from Chicago. Um, he's opened up for Dave Chappelle 50 times. Oh, right? Like that's pretty, when he told me that, I was like, I'm going to say that one. That's, that's pretty, pretty big. Right? So everybody give a warm My People's Welcome uh, to Asar Usman. <laughs> and the technology is also here to scare all of you. Uh, I'm perfectly aware most of you have never seen somebody who looks like me smile before. <laughs> Unless you had a lot of Ubers. Uh, that's very common. Very friendly people in the Uber organization. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to give this a minute to sink in. If you guys just know, <laughs> you really weirded out right now. Uh, my name is Azhar. I'm from Chicago. My parents are originally from India. Uh, that's right, represent indeed. I'm not sure which side you're representing there, but uh, <laughs> sure, I take it, yes. Just general representation, yes. <laughs> I'm in favor of general representation, you know. Uh, but, but I did realize recently, if you're not white or black in America, and somebody asks you where you're from, it's always a multi-part yes. question. <laughs> always a multi, I, I got pulled over by a cop. <laughs> Relax, <laughs> I got, I got pulled over by a cop, true story. He's like, uh, where are you from? I was like, uh, Chicago. <laughs> no, but where are you from? <laughs> uh, same question, Chicago. 
No, where are you really from? Uh, Skokie. It's a northern suburb of Chicago. <laughs> A lot of Jews. <laughs> it's a great suburb. No, what are you? I'm a human being. What kind of questions are these, man? No, what is your nationality? Uh, nationality is a function of citizenship. So I guess United States of America? I think you were trying to ask me about my ethnic background, but you're stupid. I think you don't know the difference between ethnicity and nationality. <laughs> this is America. Learn the language or go home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> People say stupid things to me all the time. True story, I was stopped at a red light recently. Just minding my business, okay? This car full of hoodlums. <laughs> Next to me, I look How could I be Osama and Gandhi at the same time? What is this, terror through nonviolence? That's a hell of a tactic. I will kill you by not eating. And by the way, here's a footnote to that joke. Since when did calling somebody Gandhi turn into an insult? Right. Is the same guy going up to black people like, what's up, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? <laughs> Nelson Mandela? Is that your mama, Mother Teresa? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, that's all I'm saying. But there, there, let's be honest, there's a lot of racism right now, a lot of tension, a lot of phobia in society, people are scared, freaked out, but we are here in this room showing love for each other because we're down with my peoples. <laughs> and that is why, and that is why we are actually witnessing this country undergo a transformation. In front of our eyes, it's amazing. Right, we are witnessing the dawn of a new day. The birth of the white civil rights movement. <laughs> headed by a great leader, Donald Trump. Yes. Donald Trump is the Martin Luther King of white people. Oh, no. And before him, and before him it was Donald Sterling. And before that it was Don Imus. I'm not sure if we have a white problem or a Donald problem. <laughs> I don't trust Donald Duck anymore. <laughs> I'm waiting for that secret recording where he called Daffy Duck the N-word. <laughs> White civil rights movement is serious, baby, all right? They have an agenda. Number one, gun rights, okay? Right, right. Number two, in case you missed it, more. <laughs> you gotta rate that body and murder everybody. Those are the rules. <laughs> I'll leave you with this, people. You can imagine what it feels like to be me, an American Muslim stand-up comedian. A big part of my life is traveling. <laughs> Through airports <laughs> all the time. <laughs> That sound is correct. Aww, that's exactly <laughs> how you should feel all the time. People are nervous around me all the time. They're nervous. I'm nervous. Their nervousness makes me nervous. They got scary announcements in the airport, right? Scary signs. I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen them, right? If you see something, say something. It's a pretty ambiguous set of instructions. <laughs> If you see something, say something. I'll be standing in that line at TSA like, I see a lot of things. I should say something. What should I say? I'm gonna die, I'm gonna get shot. That's not fair. I'm following airport instructions. Don't tase me, bro. You know what I'm saying? And the final piece, final, my final thought is, uh, you know, as if it's not stressful enough just flying, right? When you get to the gate at an airport, you should be able to calm your nerves, right? You're about to do a scary thing nowadays, getting on a plane, bad weather, accidents, planes keep disappearing. Yeah, we're all pretending that's not happening. Right. Real life lost happening somewhere. Yeah. 
We're all pretending it's not real. Yeah. Like terrorism, you should be able to relax and get in the zone. Oh no, oh no. US government thought it's a good idea to put a TV screen at every boarding uh -huh. gate in America, right. showing 24 seven news coverage of CNN. Scary as shit happening <laughs> right now. <laughs> I was sitting at the gate one time, I forgot there was a screen above my head. Okay, I swear to God, just swear, they were showing an ISIS beheading. Everybody at the gate, looking at ISIS, looking at me. <laughs> looking at ISIS, looking at me. I just want to be like, I didn't do it. I'm in Chicago with you. Look, it's happening right now, it's live, look, look. Damn, it says recorded earlier. It could be me. Hypothetically, it's not me. And by the way, if it is me, you have bigger problems, I'm already at the gate. How do you like that happens? Hey, thank you very much for that. Thanks, man. I don't even know how to follow that. Like, it was so funny. Thank you so much. Um, so we're transitioning into the final section of the evening, which for us, we like to call real talk, which is basically a couple minutes to like have some real, real talk. Although I think we kind of already did. We've been, we've been going in. Yeah. Um, but I want to I wanna just kind of wrap our, our show up tonight with the idea of fear, because it's kind of been implicit in a lot of the conversation we've been having tonight, right? That mm -hmm. what people are afraid of, it was certainly implicit in that bit we just saw. Um, and, but if we're honest about American history, a lot of times when people think about identity and, and we have the most conversations about patriotism and being an American, frankly, it's as the result of fear, right? Fear of the other. That's the way kind of um, certainly the mainstream media propaganda has framed what it means to be an American. Um, there was a poll, Chapman University did a poll recently uh, where they asked Americans what their, they asked a group of Americans what their top 10 fears were. And like at the top were things like government corruption, cyber terrorism. I want to pose that question to you all. And I want it to be two parts. I want each of you to tell me when it comes to being American and thinking about American identity, what is your greatest fear? Hmm. And then what are you most hopeful for? What is your greatest fear? And what are you most hopeful for? I mean, I think, I think probably my greatest fear right now is that we <coughs> don't make the necessary changes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. whatever ends up happening with wars or, or honestly some other large scale event, not because the event itself, that's obviously tragic and horrible, but because what that would reignite. Yeah. You know what I mean? That would bolster this war on terror or the war on drugs or whatever it is. Anything that, that, that kind of shoves us further into that direction. I'm afraid of an event like that happening to undo a lot of the progress we've made. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's something I'm definitely pretty fearful for, as well as like all the money that's in the government. We, yeah, like, we gotta get that out of there. That's pretty scary. It's just, yeah, that's, that's, that's terrifying. When you know that corporations buy elections and buy candidates and then it's cyclical, yeah. just feeds into itself again and again. There's a great documentary on Amazon. It's Requiem mm -hmm. for the American Dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good. He goes into the whole history dating back to the inception of our government and how we've gotten to here with the corruption and everything. And, and that stuff is terrifying to me. Right. Um, and just the audacity that our government has right now is scary. Like we're talking with a flint. That's like mm -hmm. an act of aggression. Like mm -hmm. that is literally taking an act of aggression on American citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's, that to me, if you see a government do something like that, that's scary. Mm -hmm. So then why do you have hope? I have hope for like this kind of thing, mm -hmm. for these kind of conversations, for Black Lives Matter, for the app that you're making, for all the uh, activist stuff that you've been working on. And, and just like seeing that there's now more than ever, there are so many of these movements and they're teaming up. Mm -hmm. And we're all, like Black Lives Matter is fighting for the same thing. I have a, the LGBT organization that re re reaches out to uh, a gay straight alliance. These are all like social justice issues and they're all fighting for the same thing, mm -hmm. which is equality and seeing each other as humans no matter of whatever you identify as or you appear as. Um, so that gives me hope, seeing movements like that. And, and they're gaining strength and seeing the fact that we have a 70-year-old socialist Jew who's potentially <laughs> going to be the next president. That's, that's, that, that's hopeful, for sure. Like that's, I, I think there, there's a lot, lot to be hopeful for as well. Yeah. 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 Mike, what about you? I guess my biggest fear is that we don't change the actual structures that continue to pit people against each other and oppress people. And my biggest hope, I'll say, is a story on Friday. I'm privileged to be a father of two amazing children.
all excited. She's like, Michael, Michael. And I was like, what's up, babe? And she's like, and the, the interesting thing about that uh, they Right. When you go out, use your voice, use your tools, use your resources, your platforms, your power. <laughs> to shake things up a bit and move us more, more quickly towards the future that we're all imagining together. All right, so y'all know what your task for this week is? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, so you can follow us on Instagram, at MyPeoplesTV. Make sure you tweet us, same place, at MyPeoplesTV. And do we have Mark here tonight? We do. We do. Okay, so we're going to end with a very, very special treat bringing to the stage from Foster the People, Mark Foster. <laughs> Man, can we just like give them another round of applause? That was amazing. I was so inspired just sitting back there listening to all this. I mean, I had tears in my eyes. It's just what you guys are doing is, is incredible and brave, and it's making a real difference. So very just grateful to be here with you guys sharing the stage. And I was thinking about what I was going to play, and, and this song came to mind because I feel like the lyrics kind of are applicable to what we're talking about. Rise above, gonna start the war. What you want, what you need, what you come in for. Even the king. 